Well, greetings, everybody. Good, either a good morning or a good afternoon, depending upon where you are in this in this world of ours. Uh, John Barber here from Takeo Comfort Solutions, along with Rick Mayo, who is our Western Regional Training Manager. And Rick will be kind of steering the ship today, as today's presentation is going to be a lot of fun and, and and very very different. It's about one of the great mysteries of plumbing, and that is how the heck do I size a domestic hot water recirculation pump? And this is one of those cases where no, bigger is not better. In fact, bigger can cause you a heck of a lot of grief, both in the short term and in the long term. So what Rick has, has put together is a very, very interesting program. Uh, and what he's gonna do is gonna show you how to use an, uh, a worksheet to manually size a circulator and then take you on a cool little journey on a piece of software that we have that you can uh, that you can access online and and help and walk you through the, the the selection process very very quickly and very very easily um so we're real excited to be able to bring this to you today it's going to be a lot of fun uh, a couple of housekeeping notes real quick uh again if you are looking at this for the first time uh, and with us for the first time uh, do us a favor, treat this like you would treat a classroom exercise, okay? I mean, like we're in the room together. Have a pad of paper with you and a pen and take some notes, just like Rick's showing you. Write stuff down. That's the best way to learn in this kind of an environment. And don't worry about missing something either. You will be getting a, an email tomorrow with a link to an archived recording of this session. So you're gonna be able to watch it over again, if you wish. Uh, there are also some handouts that'll come your way a little bit later on that you'll find that you'll find helpful uh, to, to, to piece all of this stuff together. But please do treat this like a classroom exercise. And most importantly, please ask questions. Okay, it's real important that you ask questions. On your toolbar, OK, you should see if you if you've been with us before on your toolbar, um, you know, look for that orange arrow. And if the orange arrow is pointing to the left, click on it and that'll expand your control panel. And if you go down towards the, the lower end of your control panel, you see a, a place to type in questions. It's a chat question section. What I'd like you to do right now, just so I know that you guys can hear us and everything. And I've got a couple people already just type in a hi. Hello. How are you? I see I'm seeing a bunch already. Great, Sean, Gary, Jeremy, excellent. Thank you, thank. You. Okay, bang, it's it's being populated like crazy. Thank you, folks. Love really life. appreciate that. So, uh, please type in your questions as we go. We're not going to wait. You know, a lot of times they say, "Hold your questions to the end." We don't really do that. All right, when your question comes up, please ask it, and we'll we'll answer it as as we go. Uh, we'll take every every few slides. We'll take a quick quick check and see what questions are there, and we'll address them as they come up, and then we'll continue. Um, so we hope they'd be done with this by by 10 minutes of by 10 minutes of the top of the hour. Uh, it shouldn't take shouldn't take too long. But please feel free to ask your questions, and we're happy, more than happy, to answer whatever you guys have. So without any further ado, I'm going to uh, pipe down, <laughs> which is everybody's favorite part of our webinars. When I stop talking, and hand it over to Rick. Uh, Rick Mayo from Sandy, Utah. Rock and roll, buddy. Go get him. Thank you, boss. Appreciate you. So uh, real quick, this is a, uh, a just a, a, a few slides out of about a half a day presentation. So again, you're just getting a little taste here, and you know a, a couple of modules out of a, a you know um, you know a four module session, so to speak. But this, I like to call this "Why is the system failing?" Okay, and we're going to start off with that sort of uh, mindset and show you some things and talk about some of the things we've been doing wrong for a while. Okay, it's always good to to figure out what we've been doing wrong. You know, we at least say, okay, we've got that figured out and we can go on to something better and along with that as john mentioned we'll talk about the worksheet as well so uh anyway what are we going to try to get done today well we'll make you understand that there are issues in our industry right uh give you a better understanding okay how to size that pump that's usually the ultimate question i don't i don't know what to do when it comes to domestic hot water i know it needs a pump i know i want water coming out of the faucet when i open it uh but i don't know anything about sizing it we're going to give it uh, give you some tips and some tricks, and ultimately, we're just going to make it easy for you because we're going to use a number that's based on something that's safe yet gets lots of things done for us. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, we'll we'll introduce you to the app. We won't spend a lot of time on it. This class is actually more about understanding the rudiments, uh, getting your head around why we do what we do, and then we'll introduce the calculator to you and show you that as as well. And that's just we'll refer to that as our domestic our size right domestic hot water research app 
and there are some handouts for you. Uh, don't mess with them right now. Right now, I want this to be show and tell. Just watch what I'm doing. This will be very fast paced, but at the end, you'll be able to snag these um, handouts and you'll be able to uh, monkey around with it on your own. So anyway, that's that's what we're trying to get done today. And hopefully it all comes together for everyone. OK, so why is the system failing? These are just some simple, you know, go out to the Web and do some searching on uh, water velocity and pipe failures. OK, this again, we're not poking fun at anybody. We're not picking on anybody. We're going to show, we're going to expose everybody, so to speak, in this uh, session. You can see we've got some copper pipe here uh, with some pinholes in it. You can see the actual holes in the pipe here from velocity, erosion, corrosion. That almost sounds like we're starting a song, but um, understand that that exists. Most everybody that's been in this industry anytime at all has either witnessed this or heard about it. And, uh, you know, you end up with a sprinkler system and you're not supposed to have it. So uh, guess what? The pl plastic pipe folk aren't exempt from this either. Now there's some, you know, uh, plastic pipes, a good product, just like copper is a good product. Again, I'm not picking on anybody specifically. I'm just saying, hey, everybody's got issues with this certain way that things come together, perfect storm scenario. And I'll go through that and make sure you feel comfortable with that as well. So anyway, plastic piping folks uh, showing some pecs here and uh, even including some of the polypropylene uh, product that's on the market, okay? Uh, we know what velocity erosion corrosion is with co with copper or hard pipe. Uh, when we get into plastics, we're uh, talking about an oxidation of the product, but not, not any fault of the product itself again perfect storm scenarios so cause and effect right here's i'm going to give you four contributing factors that i feel have something to do with some of the items we just looked at and the first one is we're starting to see the temperature of the water elevate for one reason or another either mr and mrs jones are turning up their water heater because they've been running out of hot water or we've got codes and standards that are starting to say, hey, look, Legionella is an issue. For instance, do you realize where the ideal growth range of Legionella falls? Look at this, 95 to 115 F, 35 to 46 C. But guess where a lot of people's water heaters are sitting, right? We're not just concerned about the water heater setting, folks. We're concerned about the temperature of the water out in the hot water supply portion of the piping. Guess what? Critters grow there as well. Okay, We've got biofilm and other things that promote the growth of Legionella as well. So we have to start realizing that it's very potentially uh, going to happen that these uh, elevated uh, temperatures um, are you know, show their face to us. 140 degrees is kind of the the number. There's nothing magic about it. That's not to say that at 135 you'll be co totally out of trouble, okay, uh, or 120. So just understand how these four contributing factors kind of go in hand in hand. Velocities over two feet per second, sometimes three, and I'll show you what I mean by that. But the 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 speed of the water moving through the pipe has a lot to do with some of the problems that we see. And the thing that uh, that we know, you know, when we look at municipalities uh, treating water and stuff, they're putting chemicals in there, chloramines, chlorines, that sort of thing that's put in there to help kill the critters, but it's also uh, making the water uh, somewhat aggressive. Okay, so understand that's a factor uh, within this um, uh, issue. And then this is kind of my own little pet peeve. It doesn't help to just let the pump spin 24 seven either. So we'll get into that. That has to do with control strategy. But what do we have control of in our industry right now? Everybody that's on this webinar, myself, John included, Taco, and all of you folks that are watching, plumbers, engineers, et cetera, what do we have control of here? Well, we have control of the temperature, but if the code says thou shalt be 140, you lose control of that. Uh, velocities, folks, we have control of that. We can't do anything about the chemicals added to it, and uh, we do have control of the continuous circulation. So this velocity thing is what we're going to focus on, and we're going to kind of throw some things at you about control strategy as well. Okay, so let's move on. What are the fundamentals we got to get our arms around? What is the job of the circulator? If you understand this, it helps you in getting your arms around the sizing of this device, okay? What is the responsibility of the circulator in DHW system? Well, this is a misinterpretation. It's not 
Some people actually think this circulator's job is to have water so that you, uh, when you open the faucet, it's it's putting water out into the faucet, you know, or out of the faucet into your hands. And it's like, no, 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 don't misunderstand that. These aren't booster pumps typically, right? What we, the responsibility of the circulator is just already have the water there, sitting there nice and hot, ready. When you crack the faucet, you get it out. We know that the pressure differential between what the pressure is inside the pipe and what the pressure is at atmospheric or standing there at the sink is what gets the water out, right? There's There's been some missing, I know this sounds funny and crazy, but some people seem to think along the lines that this circulator sizing has everything to do with the water coming out of the faucet. And it, I make, I'm dispelling that uh, misconception. Another thing is, uh, we, we kind of touched on this already, how big does the circulator need to be? John's already brought up the point, folks. Bigger is not better in most of these situations. Strategically sized is what we're going to try to get you to understand. And we'll, and we'll make it simple. It's not a super mathematical thing. It's actually fairly easy as long as you understand what type of pipe and what size of pipe you're using. We can use that to kind of give us our, um, our marching orders, so to speak. Okay. So over, overcoming the line losses is what we've got is we've got to do that, right? That means if we can't overcome the heat loss of the supply lines, we're never going to get hot water to the fixture, at least adequate hot water. Usably warm in our world in Fahrenheit is about 105 degrees. Okay. So anyway, so um, we don't want to size things at a minimum. We're actually going to flow more. We're going to flow faster, and we're going to do that so that we get the job done. And as I pointed out earlier, we could shut the pump back off. You realize, let me get take this away. If you realize if you size for your minimum, that means the pump has to run 24-7 because all you're doing is overcoming the heat losses of the pipe. We're talking about pipes that are inside the building that's not contingent on the outdoor weather much. You see what I'm, go what I'm getting at there, right? So understand where we're going with this maximum velocity limitation. We're going to show you what that is for each pipe and size, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make sure you understand how to interpret that, okay? So the question is, hey, is getting this stuff right important? And of course, I'll have to say, you betcha. That's the oopers out there, if you know what I'm talking about. So uh, John will know that one. So uh, in systems where water temperature routinely exceeds 140, I'm going to point this out. Look at what we're talking about here. This comes to us from the Copper Tube Handbook, Copper Development Association, page 11. Okay, And all they're doing is saying, hey, we got this thing called water velocity limitation, right? And we want you to know that. We want to make sure that everything is A-OK -okay, uh, as far as the water uh, moving through the pipes at not too high of velocities. So um, let's point out a couple things. I've highlighted this. I'm not going to read it word for word. That's why you folks have eyes. Um, I will point out that it's talking about two to three feet per second. This is where that, uh, where I gave you two feet and I had in parentheses three feet. So the Copper Development Association will allow you up to three feet per second. If you're conservative, you're going to stay at the lower number. Okay. Another thing I want to point out, I've already mentioned, locally aggressive water conditions. Folks, that has to do with what's in the water. We're not just talking about, you know, total dissolved solids or grains of hardness or anything like that. We're talking about the stuff they put in the water at the municipal level that affects the, um, the how aggressive this water is. A couple other things I'll point out here. We are talking about domestic hot water recirculation for the most. They had to kind of paint this in a, a broad brush that says, hey, we're talking about copper pipe and closed loop systems. But really what we're talking about is detailed in these next little highlights here. Notice this says, due to constant circulation, elevated water temperatures, particular attention should be paid to velocities. Well, Okay, in heating and cooling systems, we don't have continual circulation, right? We turn things off and on with zone calls, et cetera. So understand, they're, they're kind of pointing the finger at domestic hot water systems, especially when you start looking at things like, you know, both the supply and the return piping should be sized so that the velocity does not exceed the above recommendations. Now, lastly, this is the point 
uh, this is the part you want to really pay attention to. Care should be taken to ensure that the circulating pump is not oversized and that the return piping, which is the return side of a domestic hot water re, uh, system, is not undersized. Both are common occurrences in installed piping. Folks, what we're reading here is the Copper Development Association's get out of jail free card. See where I'm going with that? They're saying, hey, don't don't come to us when we have holes in the pipe saying that the pipe's, uh, you know, uh, defective, okay? Um, let's put a number to it, okay? I just gave you some velocities. I gave you a two feet per second and a three feet per second, um, you know, limitation. I, I would say stay conservative and stay at two unless you need the additional and then only then go up to three with the uh, copper, okay? So for instance, let's just say three quarter inch uh, type M copper, we better stay around three feet, or excuse me, three gallons a minute to stay under that two feet per second. You see how that reads and same thing down here in the type L copper. For you commercial folks, you'll probably be normally around type L. You residential folks will be type M and look at it uh, as it relates. And I wouldn't even worry about this other, I just put this on the chart when I made it up to show what's typical and we'll get into that. Um, again, uh, that's the copper folks. Let's look and see what the plastic folks are saying. Okay, this is just a cut and paste out of one of the uh, the manufacturers that, that make PEX pipe, right? This is out of their uh, design manual that does um, the training on how to, uh, to to use flexible piping systems for uh, designing plumbing. Okay, look, they don't have a problem with 10 feet per second under cold. They don't even have a problem with um, eight feet per second here under hot. And when I say hot, I'm talking about 200 degrees, okay? So I am specifically pointing out in both uh, aspects that we are focusing on a particular portion of the system. And that would be, in the, as they're stating it, this is the return piping. We like to kind of refer to it as the dedicated return pipe or common return pipe of the system. Guess what, folks? The reason we're looking at this and we're focusing on this is this is where people have seen the majority of failures in these systems on that particular portion of the pipe. Not so much on the cold supply, not so much on the hot supply, but as we neck down and we start bringing that back and running it continuously, that's where this has raised its ugly head quite a bit. So let's, John, real quick there, any uh, questions so far that are relating to what we've already talked about? One, one question from Thomas Waker uh, about heating systems. We see, you see these, the, the two to three feet per second limitation for plumbing. But in a closed loop heating system, we, obviously we can go up to four feet per second. I guess his question is, how, how is that different? Uh, we don't have the chemicals in it. We're closed loop. We get rid of, eventually get rid of all the oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. okay so so it's, it, just, it, it's just a different animal and the, 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 the oxidation part and the chemical part is, is very different. It's not, it's not continuously flowing highly chlorinated fresh water is basically Correct. Correct. Right. Very good. Thank you for the question, Thomas. Yeah. Okay, uh, so in that portion of the system, folks, they're saying that, uh, two feet per second, okay? And this is pretty straightforward uh, information. You look at any PEX manufacturer, makes an SDR9 product, and guess what? Uh, this is the, you, if you look hard enough, you're going to find two feet per second, right? Here's that magic number again, a buck forty, okay? And they're pretty much uh, just kind of settled on this ASPE Plumbing Engineer Design Handbook Volume Two Plumbing System. So this is pointed out in there, okay? The, that this two foot per second is kind of a safe measure. I uh, and I gotta say, we gotta recommend that. Okay. The good thing about that is it gives us some place to start that's safe. We don't have to worry about, you know, exceeding and doing this damage that we talked about if we just follow these simple instructions. And remember, this is not TACO instructions. This is just the industry saying you want to be safe. You want to not have problems with domestic hot water systems. Follow these rules. Okay. For instance, here's a piece of half inch PEX. You folks out there know people running half inch PEX all the time on domestic hot water dedicated return lines. You better be at one gallon a minute, folks. You probably didn't know that. You knew that they were using half inch all the time. You didn't know what the limiting factor is. Understand that the, the dedicated return line is become your choke point. I would like to tell you right now, both in copper and in PEX or plastic, that you know what? Start making those three quarter. 
And then sometimes, depending on what you're trying to do, it might be full size all the way around the house. So, uh, so understand what those numbers are. The cool thing about this, this gives us a point to start size and circulators. You'll see that when we get to the worksheet. Okay. Speaking of that, let's kind of lay out uh, of what we're going to do in our uh, our little sample drawing today. What this is doing, of course, is just showing us a water heater, mixing valve, coming out with some one inch pipe. This happens to be uh, type M copper. Okay, on this particular uh, example. So I got some one inch, it reduces to three quarter, got some three quarter. I got a little short piece of half inch out to that last fixture group. And then I have a return line. So watch my little water droplet here. Just understand that when we're doing this, there is a difference between the supply portion of the system and the return portion of the system. And that's all this little uh, uh, animation is showing you that. I don't know why my water droplet's disappearing. I'll have to figure that out later. But uh, anyway, no big deal. You get where we're going with this. Okay. So here is a, a copy of the worksheet. It's not, I've actually chopped off the top of it here just to, to make it bigger on the screen. Again, don't worry about your copy of this yet. I've actually updated it a little bit and continue to do so. But let's just walk you through uh, that example we were just looking at and walk you through how to fill out this uh, manual worksheet. Again, once we show you the app, you'll 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 see how this kind of fits in, and these two things kind of dovetail together. I, I, it's good to know a little bit about the job. This is just the water heating equipment type. Uh, as I showed you on that, it was tank type. I didn't show you if it was gas fired or electric or an indirect. It doesn't really matter as far as the worksheet's concerned. But again, we're just gathering data on the particular job. So I went ahead and put a check mark there. Uh, piping material. Uh, let me give you a little background of where this worksheet came from. I just, I'm big on forums. I'm big on having, you know, something that helps me not to forget things. <laughs> that might show you a little bit of my weaknesses, but uh, and I think it's ADD. But what this does is it kind of gets me to ask the right questions. So if I put it on a forum and I send it out to one of my reps or I send it out to a contractor and they want help from Rick Mayo, I'm going to try to ask all the right questions and get as much information, and then I can put together a project. So that's really why the form exists. But um, that you know, these are the kind of things we need to know. In this particular job, it was copper, so I'm going to put a check mark there. I told you it was a, a type M, so I'm going to put a check mark there. And then I want a little idea of what the piping scheme is. What's the layout, right? What, how's this system actually laid out? In our particular case, we've got uh, trunk and branch with research. And, and, you know, until you get some of that terminology down, don't worry about it so much. Because one thing that we did in the app is we did a little sketch of each of these uh, drawing schemes or piping schemes, excuse me, we've got a drawing of that and it'll show you um, what we're talking about, you know, and hopefully it'll all make sense. So the first thing that I like to do is highlight this little asterisk down here. Notice there's per, uh, parentheses. I mean, we can put something in there. This is a blank spot, right? So I want you to start right there and see this asterisk. It, says, it comes down here and it says, this line has a maximum velocity limitation of X. Okay. Well, folks, I want you to understand that on the worksheet, this is that dedicated return line. On our on our example, you know, I want you to think back a little bit. What was it? Well, we told you it was half inch, right? So right there, that information sets a big parameter in this design. Okay. We're going to go into a lookup table now and say, okay, we've got half inch type M copper. What is our maximum GPM on that? Well, that's just pretty simple. I go to that lookup table, I look at half inch type M copper, and I come over here, and if I'm conservative, I'm gonna use two feet per second. So I'm gonna design this project knowing that I won't exceed 1.6 gallons a minute. I'm gonna use that, that's halfway there of actually sizing our pump. We need some more information, so we'll show you how that comes together. But notice, I'm just gonna come down here and put that number right in that worksheet, okay? That is that is my choke factor. That is the, the, you know, the choke point in which I'm gonna design this system around safely. The key word is safely there, okay? So now I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna look at that from the water heater, and I'm gonna do a takeoff of the supply portion of the system. Okay, we started out with what size? We did some one inch, didn't we? 
We had 50 foot of one inch, it necked down to three quarter inch, and then we went to half. We had a short piece of half inch. And then it, it turned from supply to the return portion, right? And we had 130 foot of that return. Just trust me on these numbers. You don't need to reference back or do look at your lookup tables at this point in time. What we want to do now is establish how much volume we have in that supply portion of the system, right? So what we're going to do real quick is we'll do to a, we'll go to some lookup tables and we'll get these numbers. For the sake of time, just trust me, I've already filled all the stuff in for you. Okay, this is how many U.S. gallons or fragments of per lineal foot of these types of pipes and particular sizes of pipes. Okay, so again, that's all that information has been given to you. Okay, and then all we do is we do this times 10, we do this times 70, et cetera. We just uh, carry that all out. Notice I brought this number down here on the return side, but I'm not going to extend that here, right? I'm just going to put that as the supply portion of the system. I'm going to add that up and carry it right down here. The, the return portion of the system that has fluid in it does not matter to us because all we care about, if you think about it, is getting that last fixture group satisfied. The volume of water that's in the dedicated return line doesn't mean anything to us in this portion of the design. John, any questions so far on the worksheet? Nope, so far so good. So uh, folks, if you do have any questions here, please make sure you type, oh, hey, one just popped up. Right on. Where are we getting the gallons per foot uh, or is that being calculated? Where does that come from? The, that the, is a lookup table. That's a look, good question. Look, look up table that I have given you a copy of. Okay, I'm not going to give you a copy of everything, but I'm 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 just showing you where this information comes from. Uh, and again, uh, on a spreadsheet, it's a, a lookup table. Uh, on a manual worksheet, it's a lookup chart. And so that's where it's coming from. Very All good. Right. And yes, I'm, I'm, Osmani got it. Very good. Excellent. And again, guys, any any uh, guys and gals out there, any questions you have, please please feel free to type them in, and we'll uh, we'll address them as they come up. Up oh, and as as as, as, as it happened, it just popped one up. <laughs> Does the total lineal footage of runs also account for the pipe runs from the main pipe to each individual faucet? No, no, because we're talking about the circular portion of the research system. That's why another class or another module of this training really pinpoints how the design should be done in the first place. Again, we didn't have time today to do that. But we'd be glad to do another uh, module. You give us some feedback and let us know. We could break this up into three or four modules and, and do the whole session. But again, uh, it's a good question. And it has the answer to that question is it's very important, but it's another portion of the layout design that we would touch on in another module. Right. And remember, the, the goal here is to make sure we keep that hot water main primed is really yes. what we're talking about is to keep it primed. So very good. If you don't account for the return, won't that affect the aquastat that tells the pump to shut off? Asked Jake. Um, well, the Aquastat location is always somewhat of a mystery. A lot of people put it back in the mechanical room, mm -hmm. and some people just strategically put it out at the last fixture group. So depending on where you put the Aquastat kind of answers that question. Um, but uh, it, it, it might give you a slight delay if you put it back in the mechanical room. But the problem with uh, Aquastats in the mechanical room is they can get a false higher reading than what's out there, what's actually happening. And so um, anyway, that's another uh, that's a control strategy question. And uh, mm -hmm. we can cover that in another session. Yeah, short answer there is Aquastat location is a, is a balance between the best place to put it and the most convenient place to put it. The best place to put it is out right after that last fixture. The most convenient yep. place to put it is on the inlet side of the circulator. And you're always making a trade-off if you go for convenience. Good point. Yeah. Alrighty, and one last one, and then we can move on. I believe the newest sure. energy code is requiring recirculation all the way to the fixture. I don't agree with this velocity, but I believe that is what is required. Um, I, I guess we can't really comment on that one particularly. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah uh, regionally codes are different, you know, uh, IPC, UPC, and some other things that people are looking at. But uh, I have seen some product that will recirc all the way to the angle stop. Okay, and that's that's like that's really cool, but I'm not sure everybody's doing that. 
I will say this, if you get your layout so that a short little drop or riser will get you no more than five or 10 feet of half inch pipe, you've done really good because you'll have hot water. If you do the design correct, you'll have hot water in a matter of a couple seconds, which will win every inspector's charm, uh, even the ones that are actually measuring water, not just timing it. Okay. Yeah, that, so that's two, roughly a half a cup of water. About 10 feet of pipe is roughly half a cup of water. Uh, it's actually one cup or two cups, five oh, foot okay. or 10 foot. Uh, but, but again, that goes really fast depending on the pressure and everything. So yeah. understand that, uh, again, about the design. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure they're taking it right to the angle stop, but to the fixture is actually a pretty good way of getting this job done correctly. Very good. All right, continue. Continue on. All right, so all I'm doing now is going up to a separate lookup table, which you will not get a copy of this because, again, it's ad infinitum as nauseum. Uh, you know, how many different types of pipe are out there? How many different, uh, you know, schedules and wall thicknesses and all this other stuff? So you, anybody that uses a particular pipe, your manufacturer makes that pipe will give you all this information. Okay. So this is the pressure drop. Notice it's green. We did the we did the volume in blue. We did the pressure drop in green. What we're going to do is just put these numbers in here, and now we're going to start doing the tally again. You know, this times ten, etc. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to do that real fast for you. Okay. So all we did is we carried over what would the anticipated pressure drop is at what at 1.6 gallons a minute. Don't worry that you're going to be moving through the supply portion of the system five gallons a minute. That's not what we're sizing the pump for. That's That that five gallons a minute has to do with usage, right? All we're doing is making sure that the water's hot at the fixture at a given point in time, and that doesn't take five gallons a minute. Okay. I'll show you some laziness of, of my manual worksheet here. I didn't want to put a whole nother cell in here just to have this tally. So uh, real quickly, I'm going to add this, 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 and this together. I'm just going to carry it over here, okay? And that's going to tell me that I have 6.86 approximately uh, of uh, resistance, feet of head, uh, in this addition, which includes, in this case, includes the return portion of the system. What I want to do here, notice this cell here is I've got it titled valve and fitting factor. Guess what? We're going to add some valve and fitting factor additional head, right? So everything so far has been based on straight pipe. Let's add some valve and fitting stuff in there so, so we can accommodate that. And at those really low flows that, that relatively speaking, right? We're not gonna you know, give that 1.5 in this case, although you could if you felt comfortable with that. What we're saying is Taco's not telling you exactly what to do, they're giving you some suggestions okay and the 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 what i want you to walk away or the takeaway here is is to make sure you know what you're doing when you put this multiplier on here right we're adding for the additional pressure drop of the fittings and the valves within the system etc okay so what i'm going to do here my suggestion would be simply if it's copper or any type of fitting that goes uh over the pipe not into the pipe in any way right goes over the pipe then uh, i'm going to use a 1.25 again if you feel more comfortable 1.3 by george use it okay <laughs> again you got to realize that valve and fitting factors are nothing more than w a g's they're wags John, would you like to tell us what a wag is? Uh, it's what the dog does with his tail, right? <laughs> Very good. I, I'm guessing the last part is guess. <laughs> yes. Wild? Yes. Okay. So understand valve and fitting factors aren't scientific, okay? If you really want to do it right, get your equivalency for that fitting, okay, from that tube manufacturer or from that uh, uh, copper manufacturer and figure out what your equivalencies are. Count your fittings. Most people don't want to take the time or don't know how to do that. But, we, you know, that's what we do in the heating world all the time. Same thing applies for domestic hot water. So all I'm going to do is take uh, 6.86. I'm going to times it by 1.25, right? And I'm going to put that number right in here. Now, I'll, I will uh, honorable mention for different types of fitting manufacturers on different types of pipe. You usually have an ASTM standard, just F1960, 28. 80, uh, 1807. These are just suggestions, folks. Some people say, well, that's way too high. Good. 
turn it down to whatever you want. These are just suggestions, right? So everybody good so far? Let's get into this because notice I'm still on a tally here. I want to come up with my estimated pressure drop total, right? But we got one little square, this little cell here that we got to focus on mixing valve or anything else miscellaneous that you want to add additional pressure drop in there but we can't forget these mixing valves they have a substantial role to play in what the estimated pressure drop is going to be so let's go through that real quick with you and this is review review for most of you but we use this thing in our industry called flow coefficient which we call uh, we just call it cv for short so the flow coefficient is the point at which you know, if you're running fluid through a device, you get to see on a test bench one PSI pressure drop across that. We like to use this as an example because we have a pretty good CV with our, our uh, zone sensory zone valve. The three-quarter inch sweat version of this valve has a CV of 10.3. So let's put that into uh, understandable uh, or identifiable type means, right? If I'm sitting under a static condition, meaning nothing's flowing through this valve, then uh, the system pressure is equal on each side of it. If I start to run water through this device up to 10.3 gallons a minute, I can look over here on this pressure gauge and see that I have one PSI pressure drop across that device. So that's all we're doing is explaining what CV is. So let's put it in context and say, hey, if I were to have a mixing valve, how do I look at that information from that mixing valve manufacturer? In this case, I'm going to highlight what you want to look at. Look at top of the page, CV. Okay, that tells us a lot. You'll understand if you don't, don't worry if you don't understand where I'm going yet, I'm going to lay it all out for you. But the CV is very important, that number, okay? Uh, other things that are important with mixing valves, just generally speaking, is they have some minimums and maximums. In this case, in order to get good accuracy out of the valve, I better have at least one gallon a minute running through it, right? Another thing that's really important, everything's important, but I'm just highlighting a few things. Another thing that's really important is understand what the temperature differential between the incoming hot water is and what you want to achieve on the mix side. So some valves have higher than normal, I shouldn't say it that way, higher than others, right? In this case, we got a 10 degree uh, differential that you want to maintain to get the accuracy where it needs to be, okay? Which is right down here, okay? So uh, with that in mind, uh, let's take this and solve for the head, okay? This is what the calculation looks like in my view. Uh, again, a different person will draw this out in a number of ways. As long as we get to the same end, that's uh, that's the, the important point. So this is kind of how I draw it out. Head is going to be equal to the gallons per minute divided by the CV of that particular device. Okay, that gives me what the PSI drop is. I take that PSI and I turn it into feet ahead with that magic number 2.31. We'll show you another way here in just a second. So let's lay it out. We got 1.6 gallons a minute going through the system through a valve that has a CV of 1.8. So you divide those and you get 0.888, okay? Do we take that and we square that number? That gives us 0.789 PSI. We turn that PSI into feet ahead with 2.31. So we should have 1.82 additional feet of head within that circuit that we have to account for in the circulator sizing. Here's another way of doing it. It's all the same. It's just, oh, the only thing I've interchanged is 0.4332 and division instead of times. And it gives you the same answer. Some people grew up using this. Some people grew up using that. Uh, again, if the answer is the same, do whatever suits you, okay? Um, so let's let's fill in some blanks. What I did with the worksheet is I gave you some room to actually put that calculation in right here. See, I just, you know, you got room to pencil that in and you carry that over here and then you add those two numbers together and voila, what do we got? We got the two things we need to size this pump. We got the GPM and the feet of head. Pretty cool, huh? Let's go ahead and show you. We go to a circulator that, that's within that realm, right? And we put the GPM in there. We follow that up to the feet of head and now 
we actually can envision what the system resistance curve is and we can plot the operating point. Okay, is that cool? So we know we got room to grow, right? We could turn it up or we could turn it down in this case. That's a real steep curve, but that's the one I used uh, off of another sketch and it didn't stretch the way I kind of wanted it to. I think you get my point. And if you don't, un uh, ask the question, John's ready to, uh, to field those if there are any at this point. What I did on the worksheet is I just gave you a place to tie that in, right? I, I got a place to put that and I put it right there. Um, I might have several circulators I could suggest. You'll see where I'm going with that, but in this case, I'm staying with the 006 E3. That's kind of our coolest little domestic hot water circulator known to man in North America right now. So uh, uh, a yeah, little plug there for the product. So any questions, John, so far? Uh, nope, nothing nothing, uh, nothing as of yet. Um, okay. Uh, well, here we go. Does the gallons per minute uh, gallons per foot data change with lead or energy code requirements. Um, I would suggest, I, if I understand the question correctly, that would be a no because these are these are limitations placed on by the pipe manufacturers. Correct? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, I, again, I I doubt that lead would have you go more GPM than what we're showing you. They might have less, and uh, there's nothing wrong with going less. You're going to see what the result of going less is in just a moment. All right, very good. I, 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 again, I'm not sure lead is going to dictate what DHW GPMs and friction losses are. I, it's way out of their realm. Uh, what they're going to say is, thou shalt insulate every freaking piece of pipe in that <laughs> uh, hot water system, including the dedicated return lines. And I would say amen. Yeah, you know, there you for, go. For sure. You insulate you everything. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here's from John Bellamy. How, this seems to account for flow restrictions and pressure drops, but what about temperature losses in the supply piping? Hey, we're just not there yet, right? Look, look down go. here. Look down here. Okay, we're we're, we're still go. not there, but we're gonna absolutely talk about it. And there's and Todd Mack actually just asked the exact same question. There we go. <laughs> and and one last on one. It. And one well, last one before we move on from Francisco. How did you get to 6.8 feet of 6.86 feet ahead? Okay, take this number, this number, this number, this number, and add them together, gives you that. I, I remember I said I was lazy, I didn't want to put another cell in there. So I just said, I write it over here because ultimately we still need to add the valve and fitting factor to it. So I took this number here times 1.25 and I carried down this 8.57. Hopefully that answers that question. There you go. And the 5.7 point, came from multiplying 130 feet a half inch times 0 0.0132. Right. That's just carrying over right across this row. Okay. So. Good. Very good. Take it away. Okay. So something that's very important, look at this. What's he doing over here in the sheet? Total gallons in the supply times two and put it right here. Well, why? You, you must ask why. Okay. And we're going to give you that. Okay. Uh, most people think it's intuitive just to move the amount of water that's in the supply portion of the system, right? I mean, I would. I did until it was explained to me that I have to consider that uh, a couple of things here, right? <laughs> I have to consider that this thing called pickup, We, we I use this because a lot of time uh, Taco spins in the realm of uh, closed loop heating and cooling and all that stuff. And we've used this term a long IBR years, let's say 60, 70 years ago, started talking about this thing called pickup. Do you realize that as we start moving a fluid through the pipes, the valves, the fittings, that guess what? Those pipe valves and fittings absorb energy out of that, right? You need to warm it up. And you also have this thing where you start mixing the cooler water with the warmer water, right? So the warmer water coming into the pipes, mixing with the cooler water, and that, that dilutes it, so to speak, right? So with that in mind, I need to warm up everything around it, and I need to uh, kind of warm up the water that's already in the pipe. That's why you have to use a bigger number. Notice I've said, uh, and, and this the people that wear the white coats in the labs that test all this stuff uh, uh, up to this point are doing residential things and they've tested it from half a gpm to two gpm they've said at these low flows you might use two and a half times the volume that's in the supply side and if you're around um 
you know, uh, up to around two gallons a minute or up in there a bit, uh, uh, down to 1.5, okay? But just understand the principle. Don't, don't worry about so much what the numbers are. Just understand the concept that I need to actually add more water in there. And that's how I've done it within this worksheet is I've just given you the ability to put uh, any number in there. I'm gonna give you a number two because it's right smack in the middle of these two numbers, right? So now understand when we're moving water through a pipe, it has to do with velocity. We've already used that term a few times. Uh, they like to call it plug flow. Imagine a fist going right, a flat wall fist going right through the pipe, right? Or if it slows down a little bit, you get this little stretched out, you know, it's not really laminar flow, but they call it a long bullet, okay? A long bullet because it looks like a bullet, right? So with that in mind, let's 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 show you a couple of things. I'm going to use an example, a piece of three quarter inch uh, type L copper. OK, plug flow would be greater than five gallons a minute, which would exceed my three feet per second. I wouldn't want to do that. So you're not typically going to obtain this fl uh, plug flow pattern. Right. You're going to be in this laminar flow pattern, which is somewhere between, in this case, you know, one to three gallons a minute of three quarter inch L, which gets you, uh, uh, you know, you're achieving about a 0.6 to two feet per second in your velocities. Again, we're safe. We're safe here, yet we're moving the fluid at a distant, uh, a, 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 a means that's a decent as far as velocity, okay? We're, we're, it's that thing we talk about all the time called sweet spot. We're not going too fast, we're not doing too, too slow, okay? Uh, my buddy Rich likes to call it the Goldilocks thing, right? So anyway, uh, stratification, uh, understand if I use it, if I move this too slow in those bigger pipes, this is kind of what I end up with. And that's why you can't seem to get the water hot if you're not moving the water fast enough. Remember, we want to move it fast enough, but we don't want to move it too fast, okay? Uh, again, this is just showing stratification right within the pipe, and this is a good pick I was able to find on uh, uh, just a web lookup, okay? So hopefully that makes sense of why we're going to put a number in right here. Total gallons in supply times two. So I'm taking this number times two, and I'm carrying it in right here. Then I'm dividing it by my maximum velocity limitation or whatever subsequent lower GPM you were using. And that'll give you an idea of about how many minutes it takes to flush the supply portion of the pipe. And that number right there that I came up with is fairly significant um, because we have a, a, a nice little device that most people know nowadays, okay? Our little smart plug. John, can you tell us what the time increment, the on-time increment is on our smart plug? Five minutes on. 10 minutes there, off, there five you minutes go. on, 10 minutes off. Now, now a lot of people will kind of go negative on me right here. They'll say, hell, I don't want to wait five minutes for the water. Well, and that's an intuitive mindset. What is wrong with that mindset? Because we're not waiting five minutes for the water. <laughs> because this device that we're talking about that has those increments works automatically. No one's pushing anybody. We're not talking about a demand style system here. We're talking about a control strategy that does all the thinking for you, for the most part, as it relates to, you know, turning the pump on and off. OK, uh, again, watch my little dot. I'll see if it works better this time. Well, no, for some reason, it's it's being shy and it's kind of hiding itself. All we're, we're saying, seeing, uh, we're seeing it. I'm seeing it fine on my end. OK, on my end, it's it's cutting off for some reason. But understand as we're in and around five minutes we want to be five minutes or less based on the control strategy that we would typically use now this doesn't just apply to our smart plug i could use a programmable logic controller on a commercial job and just plug in what you wanted to run and how often right so again we we've, we've got a little uh, a device that works real well on on residential and light commercial applications but you might throw in something else but it still need to know you know how long it's going to take to to do that job okay so anyway let's get into uh looking at the um the heat loss okay there's our two numbers where we'd fill it in here's a, a spot where i'd have you put in your uh, uh resistance value your r value right or i would just have you give me the thickness and the type of insulation again this was a worksheet to gather information um we'll just go through that real quick because we're running out of time i want to 
um, just show you what it means and the questions that need to be asked and the answers that need to be applied, right? So uh, again, we know that it's water, we know that it's 140 degree approximate, we know that the surrounding air temperature around those hot water supply pipes is around 68. So we got a 72 degree delta there. We know our fluid flow is 1.6 and we know what type and size of pipe that we have within the system. We need to know how long those are in order to do the heat loss, right? And that R value, in this case I'm saying I got some half inch Armaflex Rubitex, that rubber-based closed cell type insul uh, insulation. So I've done this for you already. Again, you can go into uh, the, the uh, piping manufacturer and a lot of those people have the heat loss calculations done for you based on what size, how thick it is, what your temperature delta is, and they'll tell you what that is based on per linear foot or per hundred foot. You just carry that over into a number, right? All we're doing, you'll see this as I as I finish this slide, all we're really doing is making sure that our maximum velocity limitation number in GPM well exceeds the minimum that's required, right? Remember what I said, you design around minimum, that forces you to run that pump 24 seven. That's not a very good control strategy. We frown on that in our industry, okay? So we do the universal hydronic formula, and we throw that at a 10 degree delta T, which is fairly common for what we do in the world of domestic hot water. I will say this though, uh, that number will tend to tighten up from there, not widen. So you might see some people doing designs at a five degree delta. Okay? It's all in, in the design of the system and what you wanna achieve out of that last fixture. I'm using a constant here for 140 degree water, actually 492, but that gets us close enough Okay, and that tells me right here that I'm only need as a minimum 0.3 gallons a minute. If I take that and times it by five, I'm getting approaching my 1.6. So this tells us two things, that I'm not gonna exceed the maximum velocity limitation and I'm gonna make sure I cover the losses of the piping itself, okay? Any questions so far, John? Because I'm gonna. I, I, think, I think you just answered answered the questions that were there. One guy actually typed in disregard. <laughs> All right. Well, those are the perfect questions, as we know, right? There we know uh, when we when we do those. Um, uh, so I'm just uh, quickly. You could still see my screen. I'm assuming. Yep. yep. I'm gonna go into my Taco Comfort Solutions website. I'm gonna go into right here where it says, "Hey, selection tools." I'm going to come right over here to the, the, the DHWR, which is Domestic Hot Water Research Size Right Circulator Sizing App. Lo and behold, wow. uh, there's a nice description that I want you to look at the first time, and I think the default you will read through that, and then you can hide it. Okay. And always a button to start over. If you get confused or you get uh, delayed or something messed up, just start over. This stuff, you'll see how fast it goes, okay? Uh, the first question it asks you is, do you have a research line? Because there's potentially, you know, we make some product uh, that are crossover circulators and crossover valves with circulators. You understand that stuff is only there for when somebody didn't do it right in the first place. So uh, we have that, so that's why that question. In this case, on our example, I'm just gonna do the same example I just did for you, right? Do we have a water heater? What type is it? Well, it was a tank style water heater. It wasn't tankless and it wasn't a coil, right? Our piping layout was a trunk and branch with research, right? Uh, if I click on that, it'll actually show me a little example. If you if you don't understand what we're talking about, right? So uh, we'll, we'll click out of that. Right? Notice over here the piping material. We got a drop down for both supply and return, and we did that. You know that this is what happens when people start asking questions. Well, what if? Well, there's all kinds of systems out there that might be hard piped on the supply on the original design and and build, but later they upgraded and brought some research lines back in packs. So you could see that scenario. So that's why we broke that up. So in this case, both our uh, supply portion and our return portion is type in copper, but it could be a type L copper, CPVC copper tube size, that that uh, cream colored stuff. And uh, then you've got uh, uh, the flexible piping systems like PEX or PERT. Okay, everybody good with that? So there's that. 
I like to see the details, so I'm going to go ahead and click the details. And let's put some numbers to it. Notice I'm talking strictly about the supply portion of the system. We'll start at the water heater, work our way around. Do you remember how much we had here? We had 50 feet of one inch. We had 70 feet of three quarter. And we had a little section of half inch toward the end of 10 feet. That's the supply portion. Now notice, I've entered all that information. I've got my gallons per foot. I've got my gallons per run. It's doing that. Why is it not giving us pressure drop? Well, we could do the, uh, the duh on that one, right? We don't know what GPM. We need GPM in order to figure pressure drop. We haven't given it a parameter yet, and we won't until we go to the return side. We choose the half inch, and we put our 130 foot. Now, once, when I hit the uh, enter or tab button, I like to use the tab button. When I hit that tab button, watch what happens. Watch what populates pretty much instantly. Notice what it says right here. Where, what lookup table do you suppose it drew that from, right? Look at over here. Look at my total pressure drop, okay? That's for the return. This is for the supply. I take those and add them together. Guess what I get, okay? So see, see how cool that is and how fast it is. Now, let's show you where you have some flexibility. Automatically, I will say, you folks that want to use this residential version of this, this app, we are working on a light commercial version. It's not done yet. But if you want to play with this, just remember, you can go through. I'm giving you a default, for safety's sake, of 40% for valves and fittings. But I'm going to take that back just so we can do a comparative. I'm going to put 25 in there, and I'm going to hit my tab button. Notice that number changed. Now, did I have a mixing valve? And the answer is yes. Hey, lo and behold, we've got a default in there of that little, uh, uh, that uh, mixing valve that we used in that example, okay, 1.8. You can make this whatever you want, okay? Just put the number in there, you know, 2.0 or 3.5 or whatever the number is. But notice when I hit my tab button, it tallies that up, right? So here's the same two numbers I got on my worksheet, 1.6 gallons a minute at 10.4 feet of head. But the beauty about this in lieu of the worksheet, watch this little measure. Hey, hey, let's look at this same pump that I chose and let's see what it gave us for, hey, remember my operating point? Okay, there That's it is. It's almost flat. like magic. <laughs> it's, yeah, I'm thinking of songs for some reason. There you go. Um, so what's even cooler about this, folks, watch this. I can go ahead and do job specific stuff. Notice what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm starting to populate something here, right? Look at this, create the PDF. I just created a PDF that you can use to submittal, uh, uh, job information, put it in your job file. Notice this is all populated now, who it is, what it is, why it is, okay? The model and everything, but better yet, here is a nice PDF of the worksheet that I just showed you how to manually do. There's the digital version of it. Gives us flow, gives us head, tells us why, okay? And brings it all down here for your summary and gives you the information you want, and as well as a printout of what we're actually looking for, and that's our operating point on that particular pump. So, uh, um, you know, um, that kind of gets us to this point right here, and um, let's answer if there are some. Um, again, we're wrapping up our time here. Um, John, you take it from there. All righty, uh, we had a, uh, one question about is there a momentary on push button control that will turn the system on but allow it to shut off when it reaches temperature? That way it doesn't have to run for hours uh, for, for intermittent use. Uh, for one of those reasons, people will use an Aquastat, you know, an Aquastat combined with a timer. Yep. Uh, you know, you, you put in a, the, the little dippy switch type timer that comes on, on a lot of these pumps with an Aquastat. So the timer will tell the pump when to run and then the Aquastat will say, we're good here. We're, you know, Think of the Aquastat as a, as a high limit, low limit, 95 degrees to 105. Okay. So when the water temperature drops below 95, it turns the pump on up to 105, it, it'll turn the pump off. Uh, that combination is better than either one by itself. The uh, advantage of something like the smart plug 
is that it will it will do five minutes on, ten minutes off for a two hour time frame around where it's learned that you're going to be using hot water, and it constantly relearns your your habits. Yep. So it's a little bit more automated, a little bit more you know a little higher tech, but a little bit more you know um, specific. And the other advantage of that is you don't have to go back and reprogram the clock when you have a power outage or a time change. That's yeah. that's the beautiful thing about the smart plug because we all know one of the one of the shortcomings of a dippy switch type timer is that you know no one ever reprogram reprograms those things for changing habits for uh to to go back and reprogram them after a after a power outage or when we go from savings to daylight it's or, or to standard to, to to daylight savings time yeah. so no one ever does it this yeah. the smart plug does it for you automatically uh, let's see what else do we have. Can you save this project and edit it later on on the on the uh, on the on the app? Rick, I'll let you answer at, that one. At this point in time, no. Eventually, yes. But it's it goes so damn quick. You know, <laughs> you, you know. Uh, I, I, again, just uh, you know, start over and redo it again. So you could right, absolutely yeah, just... you could save the the PDF by all means, but uh, you know the actual calculation portion of it it'll go away in the La La Land at this time. Very good. Have you seen scenarios where the heat loss ever governed the design versus MVL? Yes, uh, like when people run uninsulated pipe in the ground. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you good. guys put your thinking caps on there. You know, we're, we're yeah. trying to do radiant. Or what are we trying to do? Snow and ice melting? Uh, no. Again, I, I see uh, uh, places where they just run the lines in the slab. Uh, below the slab, uninsulated, uh, and then your ground temperature is going to dictate that. And, and right. uh, again, we might not be able to build the pump big enough. You know, you so uh, anyway, there's pro it's problematic. Yeah. Will the uh, when will the light commercial version of the tool be available? Oh, I don't know when they put it into a priority front burner kind of thing, but in it just with a wink and a nod, uh, me and another two guys are working on it, kind of uh, give and take a little bit back and forth. I, I hope to see it uh, by, let's say, springtime. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And by and it, at that point, you still have a lot of options. It, it, there's a lot of flexibility within the one that you ha that you do have available. Yeah. Uh, th this one is it possible to use the Hotlink Plus E with multiple crossover valves to work with a tankless heater? Tankless is a problem with the with uh, with those crossover valves due to minimum flow rates, Gary. So so yeah. no. Uh, at this point, we don't even recommend it with one because of the because of the flow rate through the valve is is less than what is required by the water heater itself. One of his um, points, John, might have been, though, that if I put a multiple valves out there, I have a higher flow capacity, and I might be able to meet that minimum. But Taco has to tell you no, and normally because we haven't tested it, right? If you want right. to go out and experiment on your own, you know, you you could you could you might achieve something that's that's pretty good. Some of our competitors actually allow theirs to be used. It doesn't work very well. There's a bunch of people complaining, but mm -hmm. somewhere along the line, they they decided theirs was okay to do that. So yeah, even again, though the flow rates are virtually identical, I yeah, yeah believe it doesn't that make sense go. to us. So You're right. Uh, what model is the smart pump? Asked Bruce Hiller. That's the 006 E3. The 006 E3. It's an ECM circulator that is basically infinitely variable. As you as you move that dial up and down, think of that dial as a volume dial. You, you turn it to the right, it goes faster. You turn it to the left, it goes slower. And you have some notches there to give you a reference for what might be considered a 003 or what might be considered a standard efficiency 006. So uh, you can kind of interpolate uh, where to set it in that respect. Uh, are the slides gonna be made available? Unfortunately, we're not allowed to give out the slides themselves. You will get a recording of this video tomorrow for your for your use and you can, or a link to, to view the online recording. And again, go to the, go to the handout, go to the handout section on your control tab on your control panel and you'll be able to download the worksheets and handouts that uh, that Rick provided for you so you'll have all that stuff available for you uh, in the handout section you just click on those things and you can download them all and have them forever all righty uh, Joshua Bell says uh, great program thank you Rick and all those involved in putting the time and effort uh, to, to, for those in the field to increase the quality of our finished work thank you well thank you Joshua very much appreciate you Welcome. appreciate the kind words and and rick thank you uh, i know you got a boogie thank you so boogie. much for doing this uh, great Glad job i think everybody gives should give rick a virtual high five 
<laughs> Man. And, uh, and thank you all out there. And uh, make sure, please, have a safe, very, very safe um, Thanksgiving to everybody out there. We really do appreciate the gift of your time today. And, uh, and uh, for that, we are most thankful to you. And uh, enjoy your week. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week. Enjoy the holidays. And we'll see you down the road a spell. Thanks, Johnny. All right. Take care, everybody. Good luck. All right.